certainly good to be with you tonight and look forward to our study together. We, looking in, in these first couple of days of our gospel meeting effort this week, we kind of took 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and we started breaking it down and, and trying to understand how is it applicable to family relationships. And so we've tried to take the text and the various things that love is described as there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and see how that looks in relationship to husbands and wives and parents and children. And we also talked about how it fits within the spiritual family of God and how it is that when love is the motivator, uh, when love is, is, is lived by the very def definition that God prescribes for us there in that text, then all relationships get better. Everything improves when we apply the standard by which that God brings to us. And so that's been our effort thus far in our studies. I, I mentioned last night that, that I thought I'd wrap that up, that discussion up tonight uh, within that series, and I'll change gears a little bit and share some different kinds of things with you as we close out our studies the rest of the week. But just open your Bibles with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I told you I didn't know how many times I was going to read it because, quite frankly, on Sunday, I didn't know how many of these lessons I was going to do. Um, and so, so I do want to read the whole text to you one more time as we've been studying out of this narrative. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And I'll pause and remind you that Sunday morning we talked about the idea of how does love become profitable and what are the kinds of things that can lead us away from that profitability that God would desire that should come from love. And then we learned more about it, verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, it's not puffed up, does not behave rudely, and does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. And in a moment, that's the text we'll come back to. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. And we've tried to make application of that this week. We've tried to understand how it is that love, when it is engaged in every relationship that we have, how it brings the improvement that God would desire. And tonight, I want to wrap that discussion up by talking about verse 7 and specifically just kind of summarizing the thoughts there out of that verse and appreciating that, that simplistically put, what God is saying to us through the Apostle Paul is that families should be supportive. They believe all things, they hopeth all things, they endure all things, they bear all things. All of those words give us the idea and the impression of supporting one another. And the importance of that within the family structure, both physically and within our church families. I want to introduce to you this evening the first thought, and that is simply this, that our home should be a sanctuary from the world. Our home should be a place where, where, where when people come into it, they know that all of the things that rob us of love, all the pride and all the evil and all, all those things that we've been talking about this week that create distractions in relationship to family relations, we need to understand our homes need to be sanctuaries away from all of those things. Here's a familiar text, right? Joshua 24, 15 where Joshua goes before the people and he says, listen, I'm giving you the paraphrased version, but he says, listen, you decide. Love that about him, by the way. He recognized in those days, and we need to recognize as well, by the way, friends, that serving God's a choice. If God wanted to create puppets, he could have done that, right? 
If we believe God has the power and ability that He does, if we believe Him to have the power to say, light be, and there was light, <laughs> then He had the power to create whatever He wanted. He did not create puppets. He created human beings and said, choose. He created human beings like Adam and Eve and set them in the garden and said, you can eat of every tree in this garden, all of them except that one right there. Isn't it amazing how men always seem to find their way to the one thing they shouldn't? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how mankind always seems to find a way to go and be attracted by the one thing that God has said don't do? Every other tree was sustaining. Every other tree was providing for them what they needed. But there was one tree that had been forbidden and it didn't take them long to head right for it. Choice. Man has always had choice. And Joshua says, you choose. Whether it seemeth evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, you decide. But for as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Brethren, Frank, and I encourage you tonight that that needs to be the motto of every single one of our Christian homes. Every single one of our homes needs to be a place where as for me and my house, I can't control what everybody else does. I can't control what my children's friends do. I can't control what my friend's par parents do. I can't control any of that. But I can know this, that when somebody walks into my house, they'll know the Lord reigns there. When they walk into my environment and they come into my situations and they recognize where I live, they will know that is a place that serves the Lord. They'll know it by the behaviors. They'll know it by the attitudes. They'll know it by the language. They'll know it by what they see and hear and experience. Our homes need to be a sanctuary, friends. Our, our children, and we can, we can do all kinds of things to try to protect them, and, and I get that, and, and Deborah and I did a lot of that when our children were growing up, and trying to shield them at times from, from what this world tries to lure them into and tempt them into. We, we can do all kinds of measures to do the best we can to, to try to insulate them from some of those things, but someday they're going to have to make a choice. Someday they're going to have to decide. I've always said this, anytime I've talked about family and anytime I've dealt with studies like this, I usually make a statement like this at some point. And it's simply this. One of the scariest things about being a parent is to raise your children to not need you anymore. I'm learning that, by the way. Deborah and I have been kind of empty nesters for a couple of years. There's things we love about it, by the way. <laughs> There's things we love about it. And then there's things we don't like about it. And, and, and what I want you to appreciate is, is that my job as a parent was to make sure my children are able to live their faith. My job as a parent was to make sure I educated and taught and led and guided and gave them an example and did all of the things that they would know that our home is a place that the Lord belongs. Our home is a sanctuary from the world and prepare them for a moment when they have to make their own choices and their own decisions that they will choose to serve the Lord as well. Someday they won't have me to fall back on. Someday they can't just say, my dad won't let me. That sounds awful odd at 45 years old, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds a little strange for 40. No, can't use that anymore. Someday they're going to have to be able to answer and say, this is why I live the way I do. This is why I choose that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I hope that I can continually, though I needed to prepare them to live their own faith, I can continually support that in them. That they know that their mother and their father, so long as we have breath in our bodies, will continue to support their spiritual decisions to earn honor and serve the Lord. Because that's what supportive families do. We create sanctuaries from the world, let our children be raised in an environment that loves and knows the Lord and appreciates salvation in Jesus, who, who then go off and do the same in relationship to their families, Lord willing. Because I believe the psalmist will teach us that God blesses homes like that. In Psalm 128, let me just read it to you. Psalm 128, and appreciate the sentiment of this psalm. It's, it's kind of interesting. Every, sometimes you read some of the psalms, and you can very quickly and easily tell how they might sing it. it. It feels like something you would sing. Other times I read some of the psalms, and I go, how in the world do they sing that? And maybe it's just translation, right? Maybe it's, it's just harder to grasp how they might verbalize in psalm form 
because they didn't write it in English, <laughs> but I'm reading it in English. And this is one of those. But it's an interesting sentiment. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. In the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Now, we, we might not use words and language like that. It doesn't sound all that hallmarky, right? But, 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 but that's but it's beautiful when you think about it. My, my wife is the vine, the fruitful vine that's, that's, that's spreading out and providing that which is necessary. She's in the very heart of my house. The children are like these olive, olive plants that are all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children in peace upon, upon Israel. It's a beautiful song when you think about it. He, he's, he's singing it, but it's also in some ways a, a form of prayer. That, that the people of God might, might live long, right? That they might be able to prosper. That the, the, their households will be wonderful and blessed. That they might live to be able to see their children's children. Many of you sitting here right now are experiencing that very thing. That the psalmist said is a blessing that came from God. Friends, we need to be supportive in our family structures because every ounce of it is the blessing that came from God. Everything God has provided for me, all that is good and wonderful about being able to raise our children and to spend time with them and to, to let them grow up in our homes, every part of it is a blessing. and is worthy of the support and the energies that I put to guide and shape and lead them to know the great Creator. And there are several biblical examples of that happening. I appreciate what is said in Genesis chapter 18. In Genesis chapter 18, and notice in verse 19, as I believe he speaks of Abraham in this particular text, but he says, For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. It's interesting language, right? When we, we, we think of that maybe almost as a negative, he's going to command his children. Well, no, I don't think of that as a negative. What God saw in Abraham was somebody that he could entrust children to, especially children who were ultimately going to fulfill the promises of God. Ultimately, the lineage of Abraham was going to provide a heritage that would ultimately lead to Jesus. And so God was entrusting Abraham with a significant and important role in the grand scheme of hope and promise to mankind. And he says, I can trust him because I know he will command his children and his household after him. They will keep the way of the Lord. They'll do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. One of the responsibilities we have in our households is to make sure that we're guiding them based in the commands of God. I, I know the world is working very hard to tell our children the exact opposite of anything God has said. The world works very diligently to try to convince our families and our children that what God has to say is of no value whatsoever and that the world is smarter than Him. And it makes my job and my role as a supportive father, as a supportive mother, as parents within that household to work very diligently to make sure that my children know what God actually said about something. When it can't, comes to how I got here. If they go to public school, they'll learn that over millions and millions and millions of years, over a process of time and a system of trial and error, Voila, here we are. It's my job, and I talked about this back on Sunday a little bit, it is my job to say to my children, no, no, right? No, no. Do you know what the, first, but the most important four words in the Bible are? And that's not a trick question. I just want you to think about it. 
The most important four words words in the Bible are this. In the beginning, God created. It's in Genesis 1-1. Do you know why it's the most important? Because without that, the rest of it's meaningless. If we start out the message of the Bible with a lie, if God did not create this world, if God did not speak this world into existence, if God is not the power that brought man into life, if God is not the creator, the entire book falls. That's why that subject's important, friends. I've heard a lot of people say, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe about creation. It, it, it's, not, it's not significant to your salvation. I beg to differ. It's crucial to salvation. Because if I can't trust the truth of Genesis chapter 1, I can't trust Genesis chapter 2 or anything all the way through the book of Revelation. I can't trust any of it. What's my point? My point, friends, is this. Let's teach our children what God has said. That's what supportive families do. And yes, the world's going to resist it. The world's going to try to do something different. The world's going to try to lead and educate in different ways. My job is to support the truth of what God has said on any subject. When our children are challenged by that and they struggle with that, just encourage them to know and to appreciate that as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. And as for me and my house, like Abraham's, we listen to what God had to say. That's how we support each other. But let me show you a different aspect of support. And I don't know what, maybe you've seen this, maybe not. I just want you to know something about Job, right? If I, if I asked you real quick, what do you know about Job? We would probably jump, and maybe rightly so, to the idea that, well, Job was a patient man, right? We talk about the patience of Job as he endured all the conflicts and challenges that he had to go through. We vision him as this wonderfully patient individual. But can I suggest to you that Job was something long before he ever had to demonstrate that patience? Job was a man of faith long before the trials ever came. Job was a man of integrity before the issues ever arose. I've got verse 5 on the screen. I want to start you in verse 1, Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Fathers, you want to be described in a godly way, there you go. I pray that if the Lord spoke about me and wrote a verse in Scripture about me, I would like to believe that those kinds of things could be said about me. I don't know sometimes, but I'm just telling you, that, isn't that a great way to be described? Here's this great, this great man, Job, this, this great father, who's described as blameless and upright and feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons, verse 2 tells us, and three daughters were born to him. That's a big family, right? Ten children born to Job. And not only did he have a lot of children, blessed that way, but he had a lot of possessions, the text says. In fact, he had 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Sometimes maybe we miss that about his description. Job, Job wasn't just, just kind of wealthy. Job, Job was like the epitome Wealthiest among all those in the east. Greatest among all those people. And his sons would go, notice verse 4, and his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So, so the children seem to get together a lot. That's the imagery, right? The ten children would get together at these various feasts in the various homes that they were living in. Here's where I want you to get, verse 5. This is what a man who is blameless and upright, who shuns evil and loves the Lord, this is what he does. Verse 5, So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did, notice it, regularly. I didn't know how far I wanted to run with this point and almost could have created a whole nother lesson in the series in a sense about what it's like to be the parent of adult children. We spent all week, right? We've spent all week kind of talking about kids that are in our house 
I haven't spent a lot of time about talking about, well, what does the Bible teach us about dealing with our adult children? That's Job. Job's children have been raised. They've been raised by a man described as a blameless and upright and shunned evil, a, a man of faith and integrity. They were raised by a good father. And Job, so concerned about the choices and behaviors of his children, though he had no control over them, right? He couldn't make their decisions for them. I guarantee you there were probably days where Job, just like me, where he would like to make their choices for them. But he couldn't. The only thing he could do at times was that he could offer sacrifice on their behalf and he would continue to pray. And be prayerful that, that, that his sons didn't have an evil thought in their heart during these feasts. That, that he didn't allow, they didn't allow themselves to, to maybe say or blaspheme God in some way. And so Job was continually, regularly in communication with the Lord about his adult children. That's what supportive fathers do. When they can't make the choices for them, when they can't tell them what to do, when they can't command them in the same way that they once maybe have been able to. My 60 year old doesn't have a lot of choice, does he? He just does what they're told to do. My 26 year old's got to make up his own mind, and he's got to make his own decisions. He's got to make his own choices. And I guarantee you there are many a day where his mother and his father are in prayer before the God of heaven that our children will maintain their faith and they'll keep their hearts and they'll stay dedicated and honor. Parents of older children, can I encourage you tonight that to not... To not become so discouraged and so disappointed maybe at times. Or, and maybe because of the struggles your children may be experiencing, don't forget that part of being supportive may be the only thing you can do in those moments is to get on your knees before the Father. And you may not be able to do everything you wish you could, but you can be like Job. and Be prayerful. Be prayerful for them. Because it's hard. It's hard being a parent to an adult child. It's hard when they are making their own choices and their own decisions and you see them choosing paths that you might even say to yourself, well, they didn't learn that from me. I I didn't get that from me. Why did they do that? And how do I respond to that? And So that's what I want to do with you. I want to take you to a text of Scripture that teaches us how to deal with that. In Luke chapter 15, there is, there is a parable that Jesus gives. In, in fact, it's a series of three parables. And they're kind of interesting within themselves. The first parable in Luke chapter 15 that, that he talks about lost, lost sheep. And he talks about when there's that one lost sheep, the shepherd does what he can to make sure he gets that sheep and he brings it back into the fold and he, he provides and, and seeks it out. And when he does, there's a great celebration that happens when he finds that lost sheep. And then the very next parable talks about a, a lady that lost a coin. And, and she moves the furniture around, right? And, and she shuffles everything and she does everything she can. And when she finds the coin, she calls her friends in and everybody comes in and they celebrate. For that which was lost has been found. And it's fascinating because he uses illustrative things, right? A sheep that they went out and looked for, a coin that they searched for, and then he turns it. And he shares with us the parable that we often refer to as the parable of the prodigal son. Can I give you food for thought? I like to refer to the parable as the parable of the father. The prodigal is not the key figure. The prodigal is not the key figure in a parable. 
The key figure in the parable is the father. Because he is the epitome, he is the example, he is the parable of God the Father. What do I want to learn from this? Well, I, I want to learn how does God the Father respond to the prodigal? As well as to his older son within the narrative. So walk with me through the text and appreciate with me. The teachings that come from Luke chapter 15. Begin in verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now I want to stop and realize. Now, sometimes it's hard, right? When you're dealing with parable, it, it's not real. In the sense that these aren't real people. These aren't specific individuals. That Jesus is a parable. And yet, think about it as real. And you think about the audacity of this. <laughs> Generally speaking, when do you get your inheritance? After the father has died, right? This young man walks up to his dad and says, Hey, I don't want to wait for you to be dead. Give it to me now. But here's the fascinating part. So he did. Now keep in mind, notice he said, so he divided to them. Don't want to forget that. He didn't just give the prodigal his portion and send him on his merry way. He divided up the inheritance and gave to both the older and the younger son. He gave it to them, the text says. I think that's important when we continue through this, this account. Because when it comes to that which is lost, when it comes to that which needs to be found, when it comes to that which needs to return back to life, when it comes to those kinds of things, this is the human example. We've had a coin, we've had a sheep. Here's a human example of what God the Father does. And the first thing we need to appreciate is, is that a father of adult children... can be supportive without approving of the decisions. He divided up their livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Being supportive doesn't mean I agree. Allowing, allowing this child to make his decisions, allowing him to go off into this far country, even allowing him the audacity to think that he deserved to receive the inheritance ahead of time. All of those things that we, that we might say are just absolutely wrong for this young man to consider. And yet the father decides he's going to let his son make decisions. He can't make those decisions for him. He can't force him down a path. He's going to have to let him make those choices. And brother and friend, that's exactly what God the Father does. I stated at the outset of our study tonight, He's not puppeteering any of us. He's given and instilled in all of us free will, the ability to make our own decisions and choices, and He's looking at me to do the right things and make the right choices, but He's not forcing me. And this father doesn't force his son to make the right choices. And in fact, supportive and loving families sometimes have to allow for our children to learn from their own choices. The prodigal, when he had spent all there, he arose, or there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him any. Now, by the way, just to get the right imagery from this parable, notice he said that no one gave him anything. He would have filled his own belly with the husk that he was feeding swine, but the text says he didn't even have that. You know, sometimes maybe we get this imagery of the parable where here he is, you know, he's out there with the swine, he's got a corn cob in his hand, and he's munching down on what they're eating. No, no, it says that he didn't even have that. He would have, he would have gladly received that, the text says. He, he, that's... And the idea here is to get the depravity of where he'd reached. This young man has reached rock bottom. He has made some of the most horrible decisions. And now all the money's gone, all the friends are gone, and he's got nothing when the famine hits. 
And he's so desperate that he would actually have eaten the same food that he was required to feed the swine, but he wasn't even provided that. Side point, by the way, that's what sin does to you. Whether we're honest about that or not is our choosing. we got to decide whether we're going to tell ourselves the truth about what sin does. But I'm telling you, the Bible teaches, and I believe it to be true, and I could anecdotally show it to you all night long, that sin brings famine every time. It brings it every time. It brings famine into families. It brings famine into personal lives. It brings famine into our spiritual existence. It brings famine into our physical lives. It does it every time. And here's this father who's got who's to sit back at home. And in the parable, he, he doesn't even know, right? The father has his assumptions and he's got his concerns about what might be going on with this younger son that is going off and, and, and to, to take these possessions and, and things, inheritance that he had provided, but he didn't really know. Now, and by implication, when we make the parallel to God, he knows. But, but this father is at home. Concerned and wondering about what's happened to this son, but the son's got to learn the consequence. As much as we want to as parents to kick every rock and stone out of the way of our children, it's not wise. There are a couple of ways that folks can learn, right? You can learn by education, and that's the easiest way, by the way. The easiest way to learn is education. If I can just be taught something and understand it, That's a lot easier way. My parents told me, if you stick your hand in that fire, it's going to hurt. I'll take that by education, right? It's an easier way. Now, I stick my hand in there and learn the hard way, but I must assume just learn it by education. And yet, sometimes as a parent, the hardest thing to do is to kind of let our children learn the hard way. And if we go out ahead of them and we're kicking every stone out of the way and we're removing every obstacle for them, at some point in their lives, they're going to have to face an obstacle. At some point, they're going to have a stone. There's going to be something in their path that they're going to have to address. And if I've always been kicking the rocks out of the way, they'll never learn. This young man, I, I, the father had to have wanted to go chasing after him, right? He had to have wanted to just chase him down. What are you doing? Go find him by this man's farm where he's feeding swine and drag him back home. But he knows that the only way in some ways for this young man to get it is for him to face the consequences of his own choices. Sin is hard. Sin brings famine. Sin is consequential. And if we're teaching our children that it's not, we're doing a disservice to them. Supportive families don't excuse sin. That's the point I'm trying to make. We're there for them. We're going to see that in a minute. We provide the encouragement we need. to. But supportive families can't just say, oh, go ahead and sin. It's okay. We can't do that. He had to learn from the consequences of his decisions and choices that he was making. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, the consequences of coming, finally the young man gets it, right? What have I done? Friend, I hope that all of us, when we have sin in our lives, we get to that moment. We get to that what have I done moment. Because if we'll get to that, maybe we'll make some changes. If we'll get to that consequential moment, that recognition moment, and the Father lets him get there. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough in despair, and I perish with hunger? There there are people that work for my dad who eat better than I eat. That's what he says. They have more to spare. Here I am. I gave all of that up. I gave all of that up to live riotously for just a short span of time. And now look. And yet supportive families are ready for the return of that area. It's, it's interesting contrast. You take you think about it on your own, but draw some conclusions. In the two prior parables, when the sheep was lost, the shepherd goes out and finds it. When the coin was lost, the lady turns her house upside down and she finds it. When the prodigal was lost, the father, the father remained where he had always been. 
and the child needed to learn to come home. Isn't that interesting? You just tell me some of that. Think about it. It's an interesting contrast. It's interesting, right? The father doesn't go chasing down. The father's letting him draw the conclusions that he needs to make on his own because if the father forces him just to make that decision, if the father forces him to do the right things, then what happens the next time he's got a choice to make? And the next time? And the next time? It's scary, parents. I know. I get it. It is scary to let your children make their own choices. Sometimes the only thing we can do to be supportive is to let them know I'm right where I have always been. And I pray for you to make wise choices. And I pray for you to avoid the pitfalls of sin. I pray that you don't have to learn the hard way of consequences of sin. But I want you to know that if you do, I'm right here. I'm right where I've always been. And when you're ready to come home, I'm right here. And he recognized that, verse 18. In verse 18, he said, I will rise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like of one of your hired servants. And he arose, verse 20, and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Again, it's parable, but can you imagine within that picture how many times this father probably gazed off in the distance in which his son had left? How many days did he just walk out there and look out onto the horizon? Is this the day he comes home? Is this the day he returns back? Is this the day he finally recognizes the choices that he's made and he knows that he can come home? And when he sees his son coming from afar off, he runs to greet him. And he shook the thunder out of him and said, How dare you come back here? If this story was about a human father, I think it might have ended that way. But the parable's about God the Father. And that's not how God the Father acts. Because the love of a supportive father in heaven says, Come home. And if I see you coming home, I'll run out and greet you. I will embrace you. Yes, I let you make decisions and I let you face the consequences of that. I didn't force you to do anything. I want people to choose faith. I want you to choose to serve me. I want you to honor me by your own volition and choices. I'm not going to force you to do it. But if you leave, know that you can always come home. And the Father in heaven will always be exactly where He's always been. And there is compassion and love and forgiveness waiting for those who will come home. The embrace and welcome. Even though the Son says in verse 21, I don't deserve any of this. I've sinned against you. And in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to even be called your son. And yet he restores him back fully to his family. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. A celebration. Hmm, Interesting. That is the common thread between all three of the parables, isn't it? The common thread is the celebration that happens at the end of all of them. The sheep was found, they celebrate. The coin was found, they celebrate. The son came home, they celebrate. That which is lost has been found. That which is dead is alive again. That's what supportive families do. Whether it be our physical families... Even though someone might have created great challenges to us, great heartache and hardness to us, great difficulties they might have created, we welcome any who will be penitent and want to come home. God's family. I don't care what you've done, friends. I don't care. All I know is this, that God the Father will welcome you. 
His arms are ready to embrace any and all, and you will be fully restored to the family of God. There are no second-class citizens in the kingdom, friends. There's no hierarchy that says, well, here, here are all the folks that serve the Lord all the time, and here are the folks who had troubles and sins, and they had to come back. They aren't quite as good as these ones over here. There's none of that. He puts a robe on him. He puts a ring on his finger. He signifies, this is my son, not the prodigal, not this wayward child, not this troubled soul. This is my son. That's what a supportive father does. And it means we forgive and we let go. The older brother is an interesting case, right? The fatted calf has been provided. They, they're celebrating. They're making merry. And they're, they're enjoying the fact that the, this younger son has returned home, but the older brother's mad. And he wouldn't even go in. Don't be that guy. Don't, don't be that guy. Who, 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 for whatever distorted thinking he's using, thinks that somehow because the father embraces the penitent, that his acts of service towards the father are of no more value. It's not true. His father goes out and pleads with him. And so he answers his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, and I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young kid or goat that I might make merry with my friends. I never left. And you never created a celebration for me. And then I want you to notice the language of verse 30. But as soon as this son of yours, he won't even call his brother. As soon as this son of yours came who was devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now that has some social kind of context to it, and we think about that idea that, that remember, he divided to them. And the dad looks at the older son and says, listen, you, you got your inheritance too, but you stayed, and it's still all in your hands. He squandered his, it's gone. He tries to remind him that, that your, your brother had to lose it all and hit rock bottom to recognize the blessings of this home. You were wise enough to appreciate the blessings of that home all the time. Don't begrudge him. Friends, in our, in our spiritual family, in our church family, don't, don't begrudge the guy that finally gets it, that finally desires penitence, that wants to be forgiven, that wants to serve the Lord. Don't begrudge him. And sit back and say, well, I've served the Lord all these years, and this guy walks in after 35 years, and look at everybody. They're cheering and applauding and celebrating, and I can't believe that they're... What are we thinking? Supportive families are like God the Father with open arms looking on the horizon, waiting for that day that that prodigal comes home. And we celebrate when one lost soul comes back to the Lord. And I'm going to remember that I didn't have to hit rock bottom to learn that. I didn't have to feed swine in order to appreciate the blessings of my father's house. I didn't have to squander away an inheritance in order to appreciate the blessings of my father's house. Why would I worry about being loving and supporting and, and kind to a wayward soul that finally gets it and wants to come home. That's what supportive churches do when those who need forgiveness receive it. We celebrate the return of the airing and we appreciate the blessings that we've been able to maintain without having to experience prodigal living to get there. So let me conclude with you that this way. If it's time for you to come home, what are you waiting for? Let's keep him. The father's exactly where he's always been. He still sits in heaven. His message is just as clear and as powerful and as potent as it's ever been. What, what am I waiting for? Why, why, why would I continue to live in the famine of sin? 
when forgiveness and hope and salvation and promise are extended unto us. 1 John chapter 1 and in verse 9 simply states that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what's waiting for us. That's what God the Father, that supportive Father in heaven, wants to provide for us. That's what the love of God does because it's been bearing all things. It's been enduring all things. It's been believing all things. It's been hoping for a long time that you would come home. Because that's what love does. It doesn't want to believe that you will continually stay the prodigal. It doesn't want to think that you will never recognize the benefits of that home. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 teaches us that God is the God of all comfort. He provides for us the comforts that cannot be experienced in any other way. And in John chapter 3, that familiar narrative, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's what God wants to do. And that's why He sent His Son to die. I've had a lot of great people in my life over the years who have loved me in a lot of great ways. I had loving parents who shared the Lord with me. I had a grandmother who lived next door to me all my life and loved the Lord and was a great Bible example. I had Bible class teachers that loved me enough to tell me what I needed to hear when I needed to hear it. And Educate me about what God desired for me. I had great preacher mentors up throughout my life. Older men that guided me and shaped and formed who I've become as a gospel preacher and led me in great ways. I've been, I've, been, I've been given lots of love over my life, but none of it, none of it matches what God has provided for me. None of it, none of it comes close to the love that God shared with me when He said, here's my son and he can save you. You're lost, but if you'll come home to me, I'll, I'll save you. You can be dead in your trespasses and sin, but if you'll come home, I'll make you alive again. The most supportive example of love we know is God. And if you'll come home to Him tonight, He'll embrace you. And I believe these brethren here will embrace you. And they'll love you. They'll be celebrating one who's seeking forgiveness. How can we help you do that tonight? Can we help you seek that for the first time, maybe through the remission of sins through baptism, or maybe be restored back to your Father? Come home. Come home to Him and experience the love of God once again. And if we can encourage you in that, we'd invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.